Take it away. Good, thanks, Chris. All right. Let's confirm, Chris, the slides are up. You can see those. Uh, no, don't we don't no? see any slides. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Okay. Uh, How about now? Yep, we can see it now. Okay, good. Great. So that, there we go. Not too much time on, on setup. Well, again, welcome everyone uh, to tonight's lesson. It's, it's, we're calling it Introduction to Dozer Boss. Essentially, Dozer Boss is a four-day course in Hinton, so this is, this is not Dozer Boss, obviously. So we can call it introduction, we can call it an orientation, we can call it a refresher, whatever we want. So we're, we're going to give you a, a quick a quick outline of what Dozer Boss does. And Chris touched on it a little bit, but I'll just talk a little bit about the genesis of this presentation, and then for our, also for our presentation tonight. So going back several years, working with Sorry, and, and for those that don't know me, I, most people do, but uh, I'm, I'm a fire officer with, with, a, with the county, and I'm also a forest officer with Ag and Forestry. So I am a certified dozer boss working with, uh, with Ag and Forestry. Uh, so I've, I've done it with them. And so again, getting back to the genesis of this course, years ago, we find we work with fire departments that are within the forest protection area, which means that forestry has primary responsibility for wildfire, but also ones that are outside the forest protection area, such as Newbrook, um, Bonneville, that are outside the forest protection area, and they have responsibility for firefighting. And of course, as you know, in Lactavish County, we have both areas, some in the forest protection area and some out. So I guess what we found was that municipalities outside the forest protection area they are using dozers they're, dozers are a great tool for fighting wildland fires and they're being used so because they're being used and we saw some things that you know people shouldn't be doing with dozers and you know they, they could be done better and the dozer boss course full course four-day course is offered to municipalities it's called industry dozer boss and municipal, municipal fire departments can send people to that however our idea was is to have this presentation because as, as Andrew Snook would tell you or anyone who works in safety, there's a phrase, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And what that means is if we teach you just enough that you're going to try something you wouldn't try otherwise, but not enough so you do it safely, that's a bad thing. So we looked at that with this and our conclusion was that it would be sticking our head in the sand to pretend that municipalities are not using dozers. So we thought it would be useful to provide some information short of the full dozer boss course. And then essentially, even when you, when you break it down and think about that fire we had in Hilo, and it was, it was my fault, I was IC, but one thing we did is we set the dozers loose at night there unsupervised. Now I talked to the operators and they said, yeah, they were experienced in working wildfire. They knew what they were doing. I briefed them on where to go, but they, they were essentially unsupervised for that fire. And it would have been better to have somebody so in my mind, our officers, they are capable of supervising and our officers are knowledgeable in wildfire. So with dozers being a tool in it, uh, you, you, know, you are capable of supervising dozers working at night to that extent. The fact that you, it, it's our fire, it's within our jurisdiction and responsible, you understand wildfire and you, you understand supervision. So with all that in mind, we'll launch into this and uh, there's several things you could take away from it. I mean, you could take away from this, you could say, boy, this dozer boss, it, it, there's a lot involved. I don't want anything to do with it. Or you could say, there's a lot involved. I'd like to take the full course. Or there's a lot involved. I think that I could do this better than the situation in Hilo when there was no supervisor. Or it could just be that as an incident commander, you'll know more about the use of dozers so you can apply them in our incidents to your use or as a responder working with dozers, you'll be more aware of what their role is and, and how they work so that it'll be safer and, and be more informed. So I think 
I've covered the introduction and the disclaimer. Again, I put that big disclaimer on here because no, it's, it's this is this is an hour or 90 minutes of information. It's not a four day course, uh, but I think I kind of laid out um, our rationale for it. Uh, so and so we're going to cover in the contents. We're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of the dozer boss. So machinery specs, and again, I'm not an expert on heavy equipment. Uh, the operations, which is a lot of it, and of course we're going to talk about safety. Now, when I say I'm not an expert in, in heavy equipment, well, it's kind of obvious that I'm not. We find that the best dozer bosses have a lot of experience with heavy equipment and a lot of experience in wildfire. And just like an interface firefighter can get away without being a structural firefighter, but not without being a wildland firefighter, a dozer boss can get away without having a lot of mechanical knowledge or heavy equipment knowledge, but they have to have that, that knowledge of wildfire and, and leadership. And part of the reason I can get away with that is that I, I often trust and put a lot of, just like I would with firefighters, it's the dozer operators uh, that, you know, they, they can give me a lot of guidance on, on what they're capable, and what wants to be done, and they can let me know what they're capable of doing. All right, I think that's enough. So what does a dozer boss do? Basically, they supervise the construction of dozer guard. And there's a number of aspects to this. It could start with the inspection of equipment. If we're hiring equipment, we want, we'll, we'll talk about the specs. We want to make sure that the equipment is is good to go. It's, it's, it's safe to work. It's got this meets the specs that we require for it. Of course, now and I'm I'm, I'm sure Trevor will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sure that we only hire contractors that have their core uh, safety certification, and this covers it all. But still, we do part of the job of a dozer boss is to, to inspect the equipment to see what we have. They're a supervisor. Crew briefing is very important. So they're going to be assigned resources, assigned dozers, and they have to brief the crew, have to brief them on, on safety, such as laces. They have to brief them on the assignment. What is it we want to do? Uh, and then part of that safety is, is briefing them on emergency procedures. Just what, what normally a supervisor on a wildfire would, would brief their crews with. The dozer boss may be locating the line, so, so deciding where the dozer guard goes. And we'll talk about tight lining and straight lining. Uh, tight lining, yeah, would be more passive where the dozer operators are figuring it out. And, and, and if you're going to be uh, straight lining, that will be more work for the dozer boss. We'll get to that. So locating the line uh, is part of it. Coordination with other resources. So of course, we're working with an ICS. We're working within a, a wildfire. Dozers are just part of it. There's, there could be other people working on the ground. Could be aircraft, could be whatever. So that dozer boss is going to act as a link between that, those pieces of heavy equipment and, and the fire organization. We'll talk about laces in specific, but any often we say with lookouts, every supervisor is a lookout. So particularly with dozers, the, the operators are in their cabs and they have that limited scope of, of, of visibility and, and, and situational awareness when where they're, or they're seeing what they see out their window, whereas the dozer boss should be more mobile and more outside and more in contact with the resources. So the dozer boss is going to ask as act as their lookout. Again, with any supervisor, quality control is going to be part of it. So, when the 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 so so what does the dozer boss do? What does it look like? So, for a lot of time when I'm a dozer boss, it's a matter of walking ahead of the dozers and checking out where they're going to go, to see if there's any 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 features uh, such as pipelines need to cross or watercourses or any, any obstacles or any hazards or how they're following the fire. So, part of it is working going ahead of them, and Part of it is going behind them and checking the work that they've done and to making sure that it's that that it's done to this to what we want. We're getting what we want from it. And we'll talk later on in operations about what it is exactly we're looking for. And finally, again, as a supervisor and particularly supervising heavy equipment, part of the dozer boss jobs is, is timekeeping. It's that administrative process, uh, start times, end times, making sure that people uh, people get paid and and and, and that all the paperwork is taken care of after the fact. So in a nutshell, those are are the responsibilities of a dozer boss. And as I said, they're going to work within the incident command system organization. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here. So way over on the left, we have operations. So uh, if you remember from ICS, we've got command up top. Up here we have command. Here we have the operations and they're the doers. Planners plan, logistics get, and finance and admin pay. The planning, logistics, and finance are supporting operations. Operations are doing, or they're meeting the objectives of, of the incident. And for that reason, that's where we find our dozers. And if you remember from operations, we always build from the bottom up. So a dozer may be a single resource. Very often they're put together into a strike team. Now, sometimes there's a bit of debate or back and forth, or it may vary whether they're a strike team or a task force. If you remember a strike, strike is like, so it's the same. So if you've got the same, uh, sa same, same kind and type of resources, whereas a task force would be a mixture. So you might call it a task force if you've got two dozers and an excavator working together or three dozers and a water carrier working together. You could call that a task force. But most often, I would probably call it a strike team because you've got three dozers working together. And we'll talk about it. Maybe it's two, uh, but very often it's three dozers working together. And some people would say, well, if you've got a D6 and two D5s, well, that's a task force because they're not the same type. Well, typing is not necessarily specific to that. Maybe you would call a D6 and a D5. Again, I'm no expert on this. Maybe you call those medium, uh, medium uh, bulldozers. So they would be the same type. At any rate, it's not that important whether it's a strike team or a task force, except that, yeah, as long as it's clear uh, within the organization. Now, as a strike team, say, What's very common will happen, and I've done this on fires, where you might have three strike teams. So you might have three uh, dozer strike teams working together. So you need a supervisor. And common title in ICS is a heavy equipment group supervisor. HEGS is kind of short form. So a group supervisor. And what you can do, where do they come from? Well, you might pull someone into that, but what is also common to do is say we have three dozer units, th three dozer strike teams, and they each have three dozers. Well, you could take one of the dozer bosses and make them the group supervisor. And under the span of control, we know span of control is three to seven, optimally five, they would still be super, they'd be, so that group supervisor could still supervise their three dozers and then two dozer bosses. So span of control would still be five, still be manageable. Those are, those are common practices. Uh, yeah, so again, I won't, won't beat that to death, but just so we know where it falls within our ICS organization. And I think a lot of you know how attached I am to ICS. So I just pulled this out of uh, the I-200 course because ultimately we'll talk about the special, I kind of touched on that at the beginning, We'll talk about the, the, the special operations that dozers do, but essentially you're supervising your supervisor and you're a leader. So when we go, taken from 200, just remind ourselves, refresh some of the responsibilities of the supervisor and a leader is to ensure safe work practices. So always we're supervising and making sure that things are done safely, uh, taking command of assigned resources. So, so we're doing that. Now, motivate with a can-do safely attitude. What that kind of translates to is get her done. Like you, 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 your supervisor, you get the task done. But we always throw in that can-do safely. So it's uh, you, we'll get it done, but we're going to still with a focus on safety. Demonstrating initiative. Now, often we think, well, a dozer boss, you just you put your dozer line in here. But any job that we do, Anything we do in life, anything certainly that we do on a fire scene, really it's a multitude of decisions, right? You're making all these decisions. So it's not just put the dozer line in. They have to decide where it goes. They have to decide, they have to, you know, uh, make adjustments and that comes down further. So there's definitely, it's not just a given when you're a dozer boss. I mean, there is room for initiative. Communicate by giving specific instructions and asking for feedback. As we know, communication is two ways. So dozer boss has to be in communication with the dozers and, and making sure that their needs are being met and making sure they understand what's expected of them. And a dozer boss is also communicating up the line to ensure that they're working on the right objectives, uh, give status updates as far as the work is going and any needs that they have up the line. So that communication is very important. Supervising, again, supervising the scene of action. Right at the beginning, when we talk about safe work practices. They have to supervise and see what's going on. As I mentioned earlier, 
the Dozer boss will spend some time physically like in situ watching the dozers making guard. But a lot of times they're going ahead and sizing up what they need to do and going back. And again, that's evaluating effectiveness of the plan, going back and checking the work that they've done. And again, this kind of rolls back to that communication. Understand and accept the need to modify the plans or instructions. I know often we have a plan, but it's all based on what they can achieve. Last time I was dozer boss for forestry was in 2018. And, and again, it was a situation where I was HEGS and I was supervising my three dozers and two other groups. Well, the, well, the one group had an assignment for the night and they were finished in an hour and a half. Essentially, they got to open fen and they could not go any further. So they turned around and were done. So again, they had to modify those plans and, and, and that's fine. That's, that's part of the job. So that kind of, yeah, again, we can wait till the end for, for, for questions or whatever, but that's kind of it as far as covering the, the roles and responsibilities in the job, what it is that a dozer boss is doing. So again, when I break it down simply, dozers are a tool as a supervisor, you're supervising their, their, uh, the, the, the people doing that work and their work uh, and ensuring their safety. So again, I know it's not, not necessarily the easiest to ask questions in this, but if anyone has any questions on that, if not, we'll move on uh, to specs. Okay. So, and again, Trevor or Curtis or anyone else with, with, with heavy equipment, you can, you can jump in here if I'm making any mistakes. I don't pretend to be an expert in this. And I don't have to be a total expert, but we'll talk a little bit about the parts of a dozer. Just like when we talk about in our previous lesson about the parts of a wildfire, a lot of it's just communication, right? So we can understand what's going on. So the, the cab, the enclosed cab, I don't know how common it is now to see open cabs. Uh, it seems like most of them are closed and closed is certainly a great uh, option, a great feature for working on wildfire because it can be smoky. So if you've got an enclosed cab, then you certainly have an advantage there. And that cab, and I mean, I know I started my career in the 80s, ROPS was a thing, rollover protector structures. Well, for now it's just a given that, that these things have it built in, but it's important to have that, uh, have, have the rollover protector structures, because there's gonna be a lot of stuff falling down. So it's gonna be a cab, the enclosure, and it's gonna include, include rollover protection. Of course, we got the engine, the transmission that's powering it. One thing that's not labeled on here, and again, it's kind of basic stuff, but in the front here is where the radiator is. And we'll talk about that later as far as features because just like the tracks, just like the cab, it's exposed to a lot of a lot of stuff. So it's important that it's well protected. Uh, and of course, we've got the blade is the business end. Uh, so and it's got a cutting edge on the ground and it's got, you know, got corners. The blade is what we're pushing, put, pushing with. And we'll talk about what we're pushing. Then there's the tread assembly. And again, I'm not an expert on these things, but some, some of the things I do know and have learned is we've got our obviously we have our track and we have our track and we have our grousers now the difference between a track and a grouser my understanding is the grouser is kind of the part that sticks up and it gives us our traction not just turning around and it's important sometimes we're working on icy ground wet ground soft ground and sometimes and again anyone can step in and correct me on my terminology sometimes we'll use corked tracks so they'll have extra uh, Sometimes there'll be an addition to those to those grousers, to those pads to help us with the traction. I'm not sure how standard that is. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in, but but that's that's something we look for there. Without getting into the total inspection of the uh, machinery, we basically want it to be in good shape. So in the tracks there, we have the, the rollers, which are just what they're rolling on. There's top rollers and bottom rollers. We have an idler and Essentially, to understand what an idler is, I guess you just got to look at what our final drive is. So the final drive is powered and it's got the, the, the sprockets on it. This is what's pushing the, the dozer, whereas the idlers, they're idle. They, they just roll and turn and kind of house and guide the track. Now, uh, in the original photo that I had when we started, you might have noticed that we had a high drive. And with a high drive, it's got uh, two idlers at each end, and then the drive is, is, is up here, it's higher. I'll just briefly back there. So we've got a high, high drive there. And it's common to see those on the dozers that we're working with. 
And again, I'm no expert in this. So what's the advantage to that? Does it give it low ground pressure? And what I can not really, from what I can understand, the, the advantage of having a high drive is that if, it just takes it away from the ground. So it's less likely to be damaged. It's in less contact with, with all the, the material that we're pushing and working with. So it's likely to be um, uh, in, in better, uh, better protected. Uh, and that's, that's my understanding of the high drives. I don't think I'm going to go into a lot more detail on these. We will, we will in our next slide talk about some of some, some additions in some specs. So again, if anyone wants to jump in there, again, it's not import, important that we're experts in these, but uh, that, that we do have some idea. Okay. So what are the specs that we're looking for on dozers for, for wildfire use? When it comes to size, and this can vary by jurisdiction, and we'll talk about wet ground, soft ground, heavy timber. But generally, in our part of the country, we're looking at D5s, D6s, and D7s. And maybe it's because they're older ones or because the, the new specs. From my understanding, you're looking at anywhere between 120 horsepower to 270 horsepower between the top and bottom. And even I know there's variation even within within the groups. Essentially, the, the D5 is smaller, six and seven is larger and larger. So, and, and my understanding too, is that you might classify those as medium dozers, not light dozers and definitely not heavy dozers. Uh, so those are the ones that we're commonly seeing. Uh, low ground pressure models and again we'll talk about that soft ground so it's very desirable for us to have low ground pressure uh, and part of that is that it's got a wide track and and part of it is if we've got a if we've got a d5 as opposed to a six or seven because essentially when it comes to your size the bigger it is you've got more power which can be useful and you've got more weight which sometimes can be a liability but that's kind of the things that you're balancing with that size Talked about the the ROPS, uh, the roller protection and the overhead protection. You can see this. Maybe I should. Maybe this wasn't a good example to use. You can see here. That's that's uh, uh, that's a, uh, a sunshine protection uh, structure on top of that one. I think that's all that is to give the operator some some shade. The grill are protected. So again, having some protection on that grill because it's going to get a battering with with things coming through. And that's something uh, has to be well protected. Very often, and we'll talk about this in more detail, dozers are working on fires at nighttime. So it's very important that they have good light, so they're, they're well lit up so that they can work in, in the dark. A six-way blade, and honestly, I'm going to say that I'm ignorant of what that even is, but is my understanding is six-way, it's just how it's adjustable so that you can tilt it left, right, up, down, that you can get different angles in it. So, so one of the specs that forestry will put is a six-way blade. Uh, at minimum uh, for so that you're able to use it. And again, some of these expressions like the corking, I'm not sure if it's just obsolete, but these are some of the things that we go with. And lastly, then we always talk about is, is yes, we want winches. If we're hiring three cats, we'd like to have a winch on every one of them. If not, well, then at least one or one and, and or two or preferably all. And the winch is a big benefit because we're going in in rough ground, steep ground, soft ground, where you may end up having to winch, uh, winch yourself or another machine. So we want those winches. And we don't want a ripper. Uh, three reasons we don't want a ripper. Uh, two that I know of and one I'm guessing. One, we don't want a ripper because it's not a winch. So if you've got a ripper blade on the back of your cap, it's not a winch. You don't have a winch there. Two is it's just extra weight and we're not going to use it. And weight is, is certainly not our friend. And three, I'm just guessing, I don't know if the road builders rates, if we'd actually be paying for that blade, paying for something we're not going to use. I'm not sure. Maybe it's just a given, not a feature. Any rate, so that's kind of it for the specs, the dozers that we want. Now, whether it's whether you're inspecting them or not, the other thing obviously that we want is we want them in good working order, right? We want things that work. And part of that too is, is that if we have leaks, if there's oil leaks, hydraulic leaks, fuel leaks, that's a potential fire hazard. Uh, we want it to be clean. It's going to get dirty when we're doing this. They want to show up clean. And again, if it's clean, we also want to see that they don't have oil leaks or hydraulic leaks. There's not leaking fluids on it uh, because of that fire hazard. And also, it's a common thing. Now, I'd be careful, of course, with high pressure. But it's a common thing for our fire crews with their hoses to have the dozers ask them to clean out their grills. 
I know it happens all the time when we're using them on wildfires, is they'll ask us to uh, hose out their grills uh, to, to clean those. So again, you only do that uh, at the request of the operator, but that's something that I've known to be fairly common. So we're going to talk about equipment, other equipment that we use, heavy equipment, in addition to dozers. But that's kind of it for uh, the dozer specs. Again, we'll talk about in their use, but, but that's kind of what we're looking at uh, with the dozers that we are going to be using on fires, making fire guard. So again, if no questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to some. Uh, hi, Dave. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Yeah. Uh, what does what do you mean by ripper? I'm not okay. familiar with that. Yeah, so I don't have a picture of one here. It's basically like a tooth. It's like a big tooth that goes on the back of the dozer, and it, you know, they stick it in the ground, and it rips. So it's almost right. like, a, like a single tooth plow. Or okay. Sometimes, oh. sometimes they have two or three teeth. But. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Dave. All right. Okay, so... This is this is we're talking about dozer boss. We're talking about dozers, but we do use other equipment and we're going to talk about some of the other equipment that we use. And really the most common one that we use is our water carriers. And in last week's lesson, when we talked about firefighting. We talked about uh, hot spotting. If you remember what hot spotting is, that's getting quickly up and down the line and knocking down any spots where it's flaring up, where it's threatening to jump the guard to get it under control, and then we more thoroughly do it. So when we're working with dozers, the dozers can make guard at quite the rate, and it's common to have crews laying fire hose behind the dozers, support that dozer line to put out the fire. But of course, again, the dozers can move faster than the crews can lay hose, so it may be that you've got one spot where it's burning a bit more intensely and it's threatening to jump the line. Well, if you've got a water carrier, it can zip up and down the line and and hot spot and take take care take take care of uh, those before we get a hose laid to it. And often, what we'll do is we'll assign these with crews in a division, and so the, the crew will maybe have two firefighters or three firefighters working with the water carrier. Sometimes the water carrier that the operator will be running the pump and spraying water, fighting fire. More common to have some some firefighters working with them. So generally, so they, they're carrying maybe 200 gallons to, to uh, two or 200 to 500 gallons might be common for a water carrier. They've had their own pump and just one or two lengths of hose. They're not going really far with that, but getting stuff near the line. And like I say, good to have uh, some crews working with them. Generally, there's well, there's different type, types of machinery that are water carriers. So what we see in this picture is a nod well. It's the foremost, but it's an odd well. And nod wells, we see them commonly in oil and gas. The big benefit to us from a nod well is, is that it's got uh, high, it's got low ground pressure. So it's good and good and musket gets through that pretty well. A oh Maruka. Maruka is quite similar to because to a to an odd well in that it's a track vehicle. We see see some of those Marukas. What's quite different is a skitter. So we will use uh, a rubber tired skitter with a water tank. Then now the thing with a rubber tired skitter is that it's not going to be very good on soft ground. So it could be good on upland, uh, dry ground. It's, it's certainly faster. Well, I don't know about that, but it can be faster. It's also good in the interface in so much as it's got rubber tires. So if you're driving on pavement, you're not doing any damage to the pavement. But generally it's 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 a matter of how dry your ground is. So where it's drier ground, we don't have as much muskeg, it's more common to see people using skidders for water carriers, whereas in our part of the country, it's common to see nod wells. And as I kind of touched, to, touched on before, often a nod well is grouped with the dozers when forestry has a crew on, so three dozers and a water carrier. And really, although that's the case, when we look at our organization, very often the nod well is not actually working with the dozers. Dozers are working ahead and they're working with the crew. So as incident commanders applying the ICS, we want to consider that on who's going to be supervising them. But in reality, just for expediency, I think it is, often it is a dozer boss who's supervising the water carrier. I think because of contracting and ticket, you know, time tickets and payment and things like that, tracking, it, get, it gets given to them. So just remember, they're not often going to be working with the crews, not with 
the dozers themselves, but it certainly is part for, for uh, supporting dozer guard. So after water carriers, probably the most common other piece of equipment would be excavators. Now, excavators can just make fire guard like dozers. And where we see that more than you'll see it around here in the boreal forests is in the foothills and the mountains. And again, I'm not an expert in heavy equipment, but I do understand that those excavators can be better in steep country. They can actually use the, the boom as, a, as, a, as an arm to, you know, and they can use it to stabilize themselves and pull themselves up or to keep stable while they're, while they're moving. And because it's steeper country, so uh, an excavator would position itself and then be, and, and from that position reach out and do its work. Uh, so it may be therefore ensuring more stability. So we do see them more in the mountains and definitely that would be a, a, a task force, not a strike team. But if you're working in the mountains, you may see instead of three dozers, maybe two dozers and an excavator. And this part of the country where we most often see excavators is for reclamation when it's all over at the end to clean up and, we're, and we're, we're pulling that windrow out and spreading it. That's where we'll often see excavators. Another thing excavators are very good for is, well, excavating. So if you do have ground fire, if you've gotten, if you're getting deep burning in muskeg, then often excavators will be used to uh, and sometimes it's painful. I remember the Newbrook fire in 2008. You've got a large area and you're digging down to mineral soil through the skeg to isolate it and potentially to lift it up and extinguish it. So that's good work for an excavator. And the other thing, and we've got a photo later on, we'll talk about this, is for bell holes or sumps. Sometimes it's water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Well, you're on, you're in muskeg, but you've got nowhere to set your pump up. Uh, or you maybe you've got a high water table, but you don't have anywhere to set your pump up. So in that case, we can use, essentially make a dugout and excavators do a better job of that and safer than, than a cat. So we will see excavators on fires. All right. Talked about this a little bit after the, the fire we had in Hilo is, is farm tractors. Certainly farm tractors can be used on, on interface fires. And it's what we'd expect if you're in a farmer's field, that's where you would expect to see farm tractors. And the kind of fuel that you would see, standing crops or more often stubble uh, or, or pasture, but especially if it's dealing with stubble, for example, in this photograph, then you've got a tractor. It's got, and again, I'm not, I don't know, heavy equipment or farming, but uh, so if you've got harrows or discs on it, just something that's going to interrupt that fuel and, and stir up the soil. So to have them working in that, is, and it's, it's common practice, sometimes, even with that fire we had in the highlands, people say, well, is it safe to have someone who's untrained out there? But essentially, it's their land, it's their property. Uh, they've got the equipment. And even with, with dozers or even with dozers, you don't want them really at the head of the fire. It's usually a matter of working the flanks or working up the rear of the fire. And you can see in this case where this where the smoke is going, that this is a flanking fire or a backing fire. It's not the head of the fire, but at any rate. So you got a farm tractor, it's got discs or harrow. Our idea is to, to interrupt the fuel and they're doing a, an adequate job of that. All right. So then there's some various and sundry other equipment that we have. So graders. So grader, I guess in theory, like that where we saw that, that tractor, you could have a grader going through a field, digging up your fire guard, where we normally see them in reality is doing what graders do. Because particularly for ourselves as a municipality, when some of forestry, and we'll talk about fires outside the settled area for better term. It's not wilderness, but you know, uh, more in like industrial forest. But outside the settled areas, you don't have as many roads, you don't have as much infrastructure. There's some different different challenges with that. But with our fires that are in the settled area, chances are, and I think we had complaints about this in Hilo, is the state of the roads, because you got fire trucks, you've got tenders running up and down these, these small roads. You just may need a grader to grade the road and keep the road passable uh, for, for residents and for the quality and to maintain the quality of the roads and also for our response. So we do see graders fairly often on our fires. Um, like upper, upper right here, that's a feller buncher and bottom left is a rubber tired skidder. Now we talked about using skidders before. They will sometimes they've got this water tank that they can grab with that grapple on the back. The one in the photograph here is just skidding trees. There are instances we don't see it very often. I know in the Lost Creek fire down in southern Alberta, 
they did clear some large fire guards. And if you know you're going to clear large fire guards, say it's around a community, and it's well in advance of the fire, it's much more efficient to use a feller buncher and a skitter, and also you can recover the wood and get it away away from the, the guard than it would be to just push it down with cats. Again, it's something you might see, but it's something that we don't that often do. And I guess also, I mean, a skitter, it's a piece of heavy equipment that's there and it's got a blade on it. So if you get a fire in a cut block and it's active logging, they may use that essentially as a dozer uh, to, to some extent. And then, of course, in the bottom right here, if we're using dozers, well, we've got to get them in and out. So we have our low, our low bed here with our tractor trailer. And as a dozer boss, you have to give that some consideration because often everything is money. So are you paying for that? So sometimes we have to make a decision. Do you want the cats dropped off? Do you want those to stay and be available? Or you just want them to return to demob and then bring them back when it's ready to take the dozers out? And part of that is how long are the cats going to be deployed? Are they going to have to move within the fire? So if you've got, say, a large fire in a remote area, then those dozers take off. They may not be back for days. So we might not necessarily want those. But if a good example would be that high-low fire, it was a bit chopped up because you got roads, you got a water course, you might have pipelines. So you might want to actually, you, you could walk, but depending on the distance, you may want to load them up and bring them. So again, decision that you have to make, those of us has to make, do we want to keep those low beds there? It's also clutter perhaps um, when we had issues with staging, but do you want to keep those low beds there or do you want to release them? Um, the other thing with those, that's what's carrying the dozers. We have to think about when we're calling for our dozers, where do we have that we can unload the dozers from the low, bed, uh, the low beds and, and uh, turn those things around and get them out? So that, that can be an issue for us. So that's some of the other equipment that we might be using or seeing in addition to dozers. Now we're going to get into, so we've talked about the roles and responsibilities of the dozer boss within ICS as a supervisor. We've talked about the, the primary dozers that we're using and, uh, and some of the other equipment, some of the specs. And now we're going to talk about the operations themselves. And this is kind of a key slide because, and I know I've said this before in other presentations, but this is kind of, this is how we make dozer guard essentially in the, in the, in the wood, woodland area in forests. So usually we have three dozers and the job of the lead dozer is to knock the trees down. The second dozer windrows them away from the fire and the third clears them to mineral soil or frozen. And it's funny without being sarcastic when, you know, I talk about the four day course and then this 60 or 90 minute presentation, if you give me 10 seconds, I do, I do a little drawing on the whiteboard. Here's the fire, here's the dozer guard, here's the windrow. Because one of the biggest things we've had in the past has been in, in, in municipalities where people don't do dozer guard is pushing the windrow towards the fire. And that creates a real dog's breakfast because it smolders in there, it smokes in there, it burns deep, it can it flare up and put fire across. So the windrow goes away from away from the fire, not towards it. And just on that note, uh, having seen that happen, one thing for us in Lacklebish County, the advantage that we have is if you're dealing with dozer guard and you're somewhere, say, down by Lloyd Minster or uh, Smoky Lake, it could be that you've got excellent dozer operators, but they don't have experience on wildfire. Whereas if you hire three dozers in Lac La Biche, there's a pretty good chance that one or two, if not all three of those people have experience working on wildfire. So we're, we have that advantage that when we hire dozers, there's a good chance that they, they have experience on wildfire. And incidentally, when it comes to these three dozers, the hardest job and where we put our most experienced dozer operator is the lead dozer. Uh, because they have, depending, you know, sometimes the dozer boss will lay ribbons all along the line, but often it's up to that lead dozer to follow the fire and decide where it's going to go. And they don't, 
again, the, the second is, is cleaning up on an existing opening, uh, and second and third is there. So it's the lead dozer. It's heavy work of knocking down the trees. It's staying oriented, making sure they're going in the right locate the right direction. So that's what goes to the most experienced operator. So that's again, that's that's our typical um, operations. And what we might have too, get, again, it, it, it's, it all varies. But common for this area. If you've got a group that's often will have one six and two fives, so the six being bigger would probably be the lead dozer going ahead and knocking down the trees, which is heavier work, and then the two fives might be coming below behind, uh, windrowing away from the fire and clearing to mineral soil or frozen. And that third point, clearing to mineral soil or frozen, well, maybe I should have said this a long time ago, but the purpose of the dozer guard is to create a fire break to stop surface fire. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the quality of it as far as the width. So it wants to be clean. We want to have it down to mineral soil, which won't burn. And sometimes if we're in muskeg or, or, or peat, a peat bog area, um, it could be five or six feet down to mineral soil. And we don't want to do that. But once you're once you've got it down to ice, and it's frozen. Well, fire's not going to burn across that too too soon. So that's it. that's kind of your general line construction. Now, are there exceptions? Of course, there's exceptions. So if you're working in open fields, and I say open fields, I think down around Boulder Creek where we've had a lot of fires, and in the settled areas, you might have open fields, or you might have dog's hair aspen. So you got sec you know aspens growing back, but it's just it's pecker poles, it's just dog's hair, it's, it's little stuff, right? So you, you don't need, necessarily need three cats for that. Uh, and I don't like one dozer working by itself just because it's a safety issue, right? And if it breaks down, you don't have any backup and working by themselves, but it will happen. Again, in this photograph here, this is from our fire the other week in Hilo, it's landowner's property, it's Kind of hard for us to stop him from doing it. It's useful. You can see he's in open fields here where it's not a matter of pushing down tre trees or whatever. So it's lighter work. And also, um, can also see that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting. A... Sorry. Um, sorry, but, but, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted there. Chris, you might have to tell me because I can't really read what, what it says there, but if you want to interrupt me at any time, you can certainly do that. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Dave. Sorry, I'll just, Dave. Yeah. I'll just interrupt here. Uh, Jefferson yeah. was wondering, what if you only had two dozers? Okay, I'm getting to that. So yeah, so one dozer is, is uh, say you can use it in fields, people by themselves. I mean, not really to stop and that's fine. But two dozers is it's actually fairly common for us. And the reason it's common for us is one is expedient. It's easier to get to than three, and it's cheaper to get to than three. And I think what, and what I put here, and this is in my mind, if you're working in woodland, if you're working in trees, and you got to have at least two. But often what we've got, and in that high low fire is a good example, you've got a mix, a mix of open fields, and you've got a mix of uh, maybe old cut blocks, You've got a mix of second growth aspen, and you've got a mix of mature forest. So in that mature forest is where we like to have three dozers for that work. But if you have two, it's just gonna take them a little bit longer because uh, there's, there's still three jobs to do, but you're doing it between the two dozers. It's definitely doable. And and, it's, and again, it's fairly common for us. So two do and two dozers working together, if one gets stuck, the other can help them out. If one gets broken down, you're still not without zero with, with zero dozers. So yeah, yeah, Jefferson, like the forestry is standard to have three. Again, there is some difference between the fires that we have. Like often forestry, they're in remote areas and they're huge fires with large areas. Whereas ours, because it's the settled area, it's usually interspersed with 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 agricultural with infrastructure such as roads and pipelines and whatever so yeah so we will commonly be working with two dozers um, in the municipality uh, so i i think that's uh, that's that's safe it's reasonable it's pretty like three is the standard but we'll often be working with two all right so again this is quite an important slide there's a lot of not a lot of information in here but just like the 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 what the three dozers are doing. This is what we're looking for. This is what we're looking for quality of line. So 
the width wants to be about one and a half blades wide. So that might be five or six meters. And what I explained, and maybe I said it before, but again, the purpose of this dozer guard, it does other things. Like it's wonderful for giving us access, but primarily it's, it's providing a, a yeah, interruption of the fuel. So the idea is that a surface fire will stop when it reaches the guard. Uh, so we think that, well, if six meters is good, well, 60 meters has got to be great, but it gets to a point, and we can widen the guard, but it gets to a point where it's not a good, you're not getting good bang for the buck, because we know if we get extreme fire behavior, then fire can spot, it's, it's, it can spot across the Athabasca River, it can spot a kilometer or more. So we're not, so if it's six meters or 60 meters, if we've got extreme fire behavior and crowning, um, dozer guard's not going to, it's not really going to cut it for us. And again, we're usually starting at the back and working up the flanks uh, and, we're, and often working at night. So the width is usually about one and a half blades wide. I said before, yeah, to mineral soil or frozen ground and clean. So if it's, if it's, if it's dirty and, and uh, I don't know, it's that bad, but you can see this one here is a little bit dirtier. Again, this is two cats working, uh, but you see, you could do with some cleaning up because there's fuel there that it could potentially skip across. But so it wants to be clean. And again, windrow away from the fire. And and while you want to windrow away from the fire, uh, we also want that windrow free of fire. So the dozer operated again, this is often the, the responsibilities with the lead dozer is to not catch anything that's burning and push it over into the windrow. Uh, we don't want that to happen. And it happens. I think actually my last slide of the presentation, it's it skipped the windrow. It, it skipped the dozer garden, got into the windrow. And we'll just you'll just see it on, on uh, fires where you put dozer guard in, well then you have to go back and put it around again because it's gotten into the windrow and it's got or it's gotten across the line. That that just happens. But so this is the quality of line we're looking for. And again, this is part of the job as a dozer, uh, as a dozer boss. So this actual this, this photograph from 2018. <clears throat> This is actually the reason I took this photograph is so I could show it to the dozer, but to the dozer operator and say, hey, could you go back and widen this line? Like it's a bit narrow. And that's very common practice is when they're done their line is to reinforce it, to go back and clean it up, go back to widen it a little bit. So it's not like it's a uh, finding fault or whatever. It's a common practice. And again, like that hot spotting, you want to get it closed. You want to get it in kit. Uh, you want to get guard around it. But in your haste to do that, you may find that, well, I'd like um, to be improve it, widen it, clean it up. So it's common to turn them around. So this one's not quite a blade and a half wide and wanted this one a bit wider. So they did go back. It is to mineral soil. It is clean. They have windrowed away from the fire. And off, honestly, honestly, these fires are not always so clean. Like you can't see the fire there. Sometimes it's right against the black, but it was there. It was not far from the fire. Uh, so that's kind of some of the things we're looking for in quality. And again, the dozer boss is going to be a combination of working with the dozers, going ahead to make to, to scout out what's in front of them and um, checking the work that they've done to give them feedback on that. So tight line versus straight straight line. This actually this slideshow, I had these ancient slides. They must have been like 20 years old that I used to use for this and I couldn't find them. So I had to redo everything and get all those pictures off the internet and off my my collection. So I had to redo it all. Well, and this one, here's my beautiful diagram. So if I want you to use your imagination now, we're not looking at the World Wide Web. Imagine the fire is moving from the top of the screen down. Um, OK, I got that new hook that you have to go. That's fine. Ned's going to give me a hand, but that's good stuff. We're fine. All right, sorry, getting back to our slide. So imagine the fire is coming from the top of the screen down. And it's in that W pattern. So it comes out in a few points and, and the, the edge of the fire is like this. So we have often what we'll do is tight line and follow the edge of the fire. But you can see if we were to do that, the doors would be going down and up and down and up and down and up. So the, the issue, there's good things and bad things about that. So it's good if you're close to the fire, your dozer guard is right next to it. So it's got less opportunity to build ahead and get over it. It's got good access for the firefighters, but there are disadvantages to that. And you can see it's efficiency. If we just go across the straight line across the top there, you can see how much less line we've put in. Okay, 
So it might be much more efficient to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So tight lining is going right along the edge of the fire. Straight lining is putting it across. What might be more typical is we talk about fingers and bays. You might just have one big long finger and we might just cut across the top of that. And uh, so again, this is where it's important that you have a dozer boss working because if the if the if the dozers are just working by themselves and following the fire, you're tight lining. You have no choice. But if the dozer boss is with them strategically, you might straight line uh, for, for efficiency and to get through. Sometimes people will burn out the unburnt in here. I don't really understand that because you get you're making yourself more mop up. But one of the issues we do have, if we tight line, there's also more line exposed for the for it to jump over for the fire to jump over. And if it's up and down like this, your dozer line, you can see a a, a wind shift uh, that turns your flank into a fire is is likely to make it escape, whereas not so much so. Um, not so much so if it's straight lined. However, if it's straight lined, you've got all the unburned fuel, then maybe it will build ahead and jump over. So again, I don't know if I'm, it sounds like I'm talking in circles. There are, there are options. You can tight line or you can straight line, and it's just a decision that you make based on what you find. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit. We'll talk about uh, working on soft ground. So we have a lot of that in this country. We have a lot of muskeg. This time of year, it'll be frozen. and. It surprised me when the first time I did Dozer Boss, it wasn't long and I hadn't been in Alberta very long. It surprised me, it was summer solstice. It was the middle of June and the muskeg was still frozen. That was a bit shocking to me, but you think about it, peat moss is pretty good insulation. However, we do want to know that if, if once it warms up, the ground will be frozen, but when you go over it with a dozer and open it and expose that dark soil, it will thaw out pretty darn fast and that can get us into trouble. So it may be that we go in one way with the dozers, but they come out another way. Or maybe they just have to parallel the line or maybe they just go out strategically to a, to a different spot. So um, frozen ground isn't adva advantageous for us because we can work on top of it. Now, if it's non-frozen, you can use trees as a mat. And this sounds a bit dodgy, but I've seen people do it. And again, I'm going to talk about my last point, referring to the experienced operators. But if you've got a treed muskeg, not open fen, but if you've got a treed muskeg, it could be that you push those black spruce trees down. And just like we use a roof, a roof ladder when we're working on top of a roof to spread our weight out, those trees that you push down can act as a mat and help to float the cats across. Again, um, that might sound risky or dodgy, but it's. It, I kind of get to the point of deferring to the experience. I, I actually, I said always defer to experienced operator. I took the always out because you don't you, you default to safety. But again, not being a, 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 an operator myself or having that experience, I know what I want to achieve, and I ask my dozer operators, "Are you able to get across that?" And they'll say yes or no. And if they try and get stuck, well, they try and get stuck. But just like when I'm working, like I work with helicopters a lot and I ask a pilot if he can do something. I don't tell a pilot to do something. And same with the dozers, like within reason, like it's it's using their, they have a lot of the time they have their experience and you're, you're going off of that and whether that can be done or not. And obviously for this soft ground, we prefer low ground pressure, uh, low ground pressure models. And again, that's why we often like uh, the high 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 track or the the wide track the, the d5s are often our machine of choice for this so that's soft ground it's kind of the opposite of that on hard ground but it's, it's heavy timber so if we got mature aspen or mature white spruce that's a lot of work uh, to knock that stuff down and windrow it away and all that really all that tells us is that we want larger we want a larger machine and 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 maybe so maybe not fives maybe you want sixes and sevens d sixty sevens for doing that work because it's going to take a lot and obviously as I said before the lead dozer to be the biggest one when you're working in heavy timber and and the other thing is to expect lower productivity you can imagine having to push this stuff down compared to that slide we saw of buddy going through the field it's going to take you longer um, so that's kind of kind of it for heavy timber. Okay, so no nice pictures here. A lot of information on night operations because night operations are something we very commonly do uh, for dozers. Um, mainly because of these advantages that they have, so reduced fire behavior. If we remember from our fire behavior from last week, wildland fire behavior, we have our peak burn. 
and our peak burn occurs between noon, say, and five or seven o'clock at night. And then the fire will sit down to some extent because it'll be cooler. It'll be damper. Um, the winds often drop, not always, but the winds often drop at night too. So this is often when we get the dozers out. When the fire's ripping and roaring in the afternoon, we have a chance to mobilize them, get them organized, get them staged, get them unloaded. And often we unleash them at night when the fire behavior drops down. And the other thing is dozers can work on the line with firefighters, but it's so much easier and cleaner and safer if they're not. So at nighttime, we've got the advantage of that big advantage of reduced fire behavior and also the absence of personnel. So that's big reasons why we often work at night. Now, there are disadvantages. I mean, it's dark, right? So although like I say when I've worked at midsummer, not for very long, but uh, it, it's dark. So it, that slows your productivity. And again, we said the, the they have to be well lit. They have to have good lighting. Another disadvantage, and maybe we'll talk a bit about this more, well, whether we talk about it now or then, it doesn't matter. But the difficulty of a medical evacuation at nighttime. For us, again, we are often working in a settled area. We're working between and connected to roads and fields, and we're at more of an advantage. Whereas you think, again, when I say outside the settled areas and some of our wilder areas, it can be a long way uh, to get someone out if somebody is hurt. Fortunately, we do have... So, and again, for forestry, we rely on helicopters a lot for this, but helicopters can't fly at night. Fortunately, we are within range of, and we do work with stars, and stars will land at night. Um, and the other thing about landing stars is that we have the advantage to having dozers that we can actually make the landing zone. So make sure that it's clear. So it's something we have to consider though, and it is something we have to cover. So I think for night operations, now anytime you're working with dozer bosses, you wanna get them up for reconnaissance flight so they can see what they're up against. When I talked about straight lining, how do you know where to straight line? I remember what the first time my dozer boss date myself gps was even like we didn't didn't even have much for the way for handheld gps units never mind cell phones and this was a little bit maybe this was dodgy but i don't know many pilots would let you do this but what we used to do is we would take a spike like a six inch nail and we tie a piece of flagging tape to it six or eight feet long and we fly over and say yeah we want to we want a straight line across this unburnt and we throw that out the window of the helicopter so that we could find it when we're walking on the ground as the dozer boss. Yeah, I guess those were the good old days. We don't do that too much. Now you'd mark on your GPS, or if you fly, you take a photo with your phone and then use that as your reference. So important that you have a re that, that reconnaissance flight, especially if you're working at night to do that before dark. And I know maybe it's an advantage for me having been a dozer boss and worked as a dozer boss, that when I'm operations section chief or incident commander, I sure make sure that it's a priority to get the the dozer boss up for that flight. And very often it's a matter of getting the lead dozer operator as well, get them up for a flight and see it. So much better if you can see things from the air. Again, now that you take photos with your cell phone and refer to those when you're on the ground, uh, it's very useful for, for, for safety and productivity. So night operations, you have to look at your supervision and communication. So remember I said too, the dozer boss, you're communicating with your dozers, but also with your supervisors and people above you in the chain of command. So what, what is your, how do you arrange that? And I found it interesting when we had the floods here that we had a daytime and a nighttime uh, incident commander. Um, whereas in, in forestry, generally, we don't have anyone on at night. So what we, when I say that, you know, generally what we'd have if we have dozers working overnight is that you have a dozer boss and you may have a heavy equipment group supervisor in the field active. And then what they would do is essentially the op section chief um, or perhaps the incident commander would be essentially on call. So you would have uh, you would they would leave a radio on on, a, on not the ground to ground frequency, but on on on, on maybe the repeater frequency or the, if you've got cell coverage, it just be available on their cell phone. So supervision, yeah, the dozer boss is supervising. Maybe they've got a heavy equipment group supervisor supervising them, but they, they may be the top of the food chain as far as supervision. But you just have to make sure that you do have someone that you can contact. Again, if things go wrong, that you can wake somebody up and get someone that you need. Medical evacuation, I think we've already talked about. So then for night operations, <clears throat> excuse me, night operations, and this particularly gets when we get 
again, perhaps more so for, again, for forestry where you're working in outside the settled areas where you've got larger fires and less access. Then you have to think about switching out your operators. When we talk about safety, one thing we'll talk about is fatigue. Um, because I know my first shift is dozer boss. It was a normal work, started as a normal work day for me, started at 7.30, 8 o'clock, started at work. And then I got called out to a fire. Then I hit the line with the dozers at 8 o'clock at night. It was 4.30 the next afternoon before I was finished. And honestly, between noon and 4.30, I wasn't good for much. And that can be a, a, a big safety issue. So if you're going to have those night operations, you have to think. And again, if we have a contract with a machine, and we're contracting the machine, talking to the contractor, like whether it's um, Kosakovich or, or Swamp Cats or whoever, and saying, look, we want to keep these cats on, but we need fresh operators for the morning. And then you'll switch out and pull them out. And by the same token, if those operators are staying on, they need to be fed. And especially for those larger fires that forestry deals with, they might need fuel because often for us on our smaller fires and in the settled areas, they'll go out and they'll come back to the same location. But it could be, uh, I know on a lot of our forestry fires, they've gone out, it's daybreak, they're done, they're out of fuel, and they're in the middle of nowhere. So we have to sling fuel into them. We have to fly in uh, operators and get the other operator out. So all things to think about. So that's kind of night operations. And again, very common, very effective. And again, where we have the importance maybe of this training or having somebody to supervise these, these workers uh, because you don't op often the, the rest of our, our command structure as is done for the day. All right, so that's night operations. <clears throat> Air support. So we talk about wildland firefighting or any firefighting. We've essentially got our tools in the tool toolbox, tools in the toolkit that we can use. Dozers are one of them, and air is another. So we use them together at times. And often what we're doing is we'll reinforce the line. So well, I said, yeah, generally we keep it a blade and a half. You can see here we made it quite a bit wider, this dozer guard. And it's stopping surface fire, but you might be concerned about it spotting across the line. So often, if there's a particular section of the fire that we're concerned about, then we may lay some retardant down on the, not on the fire side, but the opposite side. So if we do get embers or sparks going across the fire guard, across the dozer guard, they're less likely to ignite because the, the line is being reinforced and, and uh, widened with retardant. So essentially, you know, when we talk about even um, uh, indirect fire attack, we're widening our brakes. So you could do that by burning out. You could do that with dozers. You could do that with laying retardant. So it's common to lay retardant outside. The other thing that air support can do, and I'm thinking of these next two points, is more with helicopters, with rotary wing, is they can protect the operators. So when I've got helicopters working with me, when we've got helicopters working with us, we, they've got a good view of things. We don't necessarily, we'll give them tasks but you can't micromanage them. So often it will be, okay, well, this is where the head, this is, we want you to control spot fires along here. Um, and, and if they're working with dozers, essentially drop their buckets on anything that's flaring up near the line or obviously any spots that go over the line. But the other thing is, and again, when I think about the Yarnell Hill fire, where those 19 firefighters, 19 died, one of the issues when I've read the accounts of that is they called for air support and air support didn't know where they were. So dozers, uh, with having bucket support working with them, they're going to be aware of that. And obviously our priority is life safety. So when we've got machines bucketing, often what they're doing is, yeah, they've got their targets, flare ups inside the line or spot fires outside the line, but their priority is always our, our ground resources. So that includes the dozers. And the other thing that the helicopters do, the, the air support, the, the rotary wing, is they act as lookouts. So again, they, they can watch the fire behavior, see what's going on, and uh, be that eye in the sky for the dozers. <clears throat> and if you've got someone up there, if the ops section chief is flying or the division supervisor is flying, uh, then, then, that's, then that can be a lookout. Often, even if you just got helicopters that are bucketing, so there's no forestry staff in there, so maybe they're not experts in wildfire, but very often they are because they've fought more fire than we have, some of those experienced pilots. And even without being 
maybe as trained or knowledgeable as we might be, or some of some of us might be, that they can still be that lookout and and and, and give us a heads up that things are uh, things are being threatened. So that's kind of how we use our air support with us. One thing that's quite a large part of the job for a dozer boss, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, is is pipeline crossings. And <clears throat> the first point here, ensure that they're needed and avoid if possible. We're fortunate again when I talk about this difference, working in this settled area with broken up by roads. So do you have to cross that pipeline or can you come around the other way and work in from the other side? Generally, we want to avoid crossing pipelines when we are working. Uh, when we're putting in dozer guard. The other thing to do is they all have markers on them. They all have emergency contacts. So the other thing to do is to contact the company and say, we'd like to cross this pipeline. And, and they may send someone out to work with you. They may give you instructions. Obviously, they may have specific knowledge about that, about the pipeline. Because it's general rules, like a, a meter of fill. And often what they're doing is just getting a borrow pit next to the pipeline and pushing it up over the pipeline. But where is the pipe actually? Is it, I mean, the roach often helps. It's under that mound, but you might not know exactly. So you have to make it nice and wide. Um, but again, I'm not going to get into that a lot. So I guess crossing pipelines for our purposes, I'm going to say to, to avoid it if you can. And if we really must, then it's essential that you contact the company and get direction from the company and preferably get them out on site. So that's something for the dozer boss to think about. Obviously, when you're walking ahead of the cats or even the incident commander or ops chief or the dozer boss, when you're looking at the, when you're flying and it's looking, oh, there's a pipeline there or, or, or your personal knowledge of the area to know that you've got that. Because if you are going to need to cross them, obviously the earlier that you contact the company, the better. So crossing pipelines, so railway tracks are kind of similar. So we want to avoid crossing them. You have to contact the rail company and often we can avoid them just by going where the roads go and then building up to either side. If it's a matter of crossing roads, then this is something that is common practice. So chances are the low beds are going to have some, a bunch of tires that they can use to throw down so you don't smack up the pavement. But uh, the pipelines are more unique for and again, it's more of an issue when it's in the outside the settled area. Similarly, we we'll talk about stream crossings. So same thing, ensure that they're needed and avoid it if, if at all possible. Uh, if you do need to put in a stream crossing, put it at a narrow spot where it's well-defined. And often where the stream is narrow and the banks are well-defined is also gonna be more solid as opposed to swampy because that's gonna you know, make a mess. If you do have to use it, we wanna use trees and brush, not soil. For our, for our crossing fill. And then if we do need to do that, then we get an important job for the dozer boss to identify that we have a crossing there and recognize that it has to be reclaimed. Um, yeah, so a big issue again for forestry and our more remote areas, it's something that we should in large part be able to avoid working in the settled area as we do. Okay, we're getting closer to the end here. Something of operation. So I, I talked about before. Um, so here's an example of a bell hole or a sump. So we're in this muskeg, there's water under our feet, but we don't have any access for our pumps. So an excavator can do this, a dozer can do this. To me, it's, it's a little bit dodgy. And to be honest with you, these things scare me. How deep is that? I don't know. I don't want to fall in. But and you, you know, look at this. This was the, I don't know if anyone remembers, I'm trying to remember what year that was, but the Donutville. There was a fire in Donutville. Uh, outside the forest protection area, Athabasca County, but I was on that fire. And just look at the quality of that peat moss. You could put that in your garden, couldn't you? But so yeah, there's water underneath that and, and getting in there and digging that hole, you can see what an excellent pump site that is. Uh, just, just so, so if you're, so that might be something that a, a dozer boss is asked to provide for a crew is we need a pump site. Can we get a bell hole or a sump? So, I mean, I keep talking about inside and outside the settled areas. There's two things I'm going to talk about that are almost never going to be an issue for us. So, if you're a dozer boss working outside the settled area, one thing is Hellespas. So, what we want to do is every two kilometers, so every mile or two kilometers, we want to put in a Hellespot. That's usually 30 meters square, like 100 feet by 100 feet. And the reason we do this is because... Uh, well, two reasons. One is we may need to, to fly in 
and, and land with the helicopter to drop off crews to work on the fire. And the other is, well, we've got crews working on the fire. Very often those helispots will provide a safety zone. And we talk about our, our laces, which we will soon. So those helispots can provide a safety zone. So it's good to have those out along the line. It's not going to be common for us because usually, again, it's broken up. Our, our fires are broken up by fields and by uh, infrastructure such as uh, well sites, roads, uh, yeah, often fields, so that uh, we don't need that. It's not something we're going to see very often that we need to do that. But if we're going more than two kilometers and we're through bush, get into those situations. I don't know, maybe there's some areas like in the, in the sand hills there or whatever, uh, the south south of Plamond in there. Maybe, maybe you would need to do that. Something to keep in mind. And the other thing is preparing for backfire. And when we talk backfire, we're not talking about going along with a fusey. We're talking about this puppy here with a we we'll use a drip drip torch. Here's a 45 gallon drip torch. You can see a big fire it comes up. So backfiring, something we do outside the settled area. And dozers can often play a role in that because what they'll do is they'll build some dozer guard that are going to burn from, but beyond the dozer guard itself that's cleared to soil, they may walk down for, for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 meters. They may just walk down the timber. And the advantage to doing that is if that's where they're going to start their burn, from the doze, clear dozer guard where it's safe, they get into that walk down timber. And because it's walked down, it's more concentrated on the ground. So potentially it will burn better, but also because it's, but conversely, because it's on the ground, it's less likely to send out sparks or embers that are gonna go across the line outside the guard. So again, something you're not likely to see too much, but if you're working in, out, uh, you know, in more remote areas, uh, pre preparing to backfire the dozer boss might be asked to walk an area down. Now that kind of covers it for operations. Again, a lot of information there. Some of the key stuff was, you know, that three dozers knocking down the trees, windrow cleared, clear to, to clean. Some of the quality that we're looking for, one and a half blades wide, windrow away from the fire, clean. Uh, talked about working at night, you know, we, we, the fire behavior is down. So it's a really good time. People are off the line. It's a really good time to work on those. Just make sure that we have adequate supervision. Make sure we have adequate provision for uh, evacuation if there's an emergency for, for night operations. And uh, yeah, we talked about soft ground and big timber. Uh, yeah. So there's a, those. So again, this is in, in an hour and a half. This is a four day course. We kind of hit some of the some of the highlights there. So last thing we talk about safety, we always talk about safety on wildfires. And, and a lot of this safety is just plain wildfire safety uh, and little, certainly including laces. So uh, we're not going to go into this too much tonight. We went to it last time. We have the safety acronym LACES, lookouts, anchor points, um, um, communications, escape routes and safety zones. And um, we'll talk about the, that maybe a little bit more when we talk about entrapment, because we are going to talk about entrapment too. So our lookouts, as we said, often will be the eye in the sky, will be any rotary wing, but that is a job for the dozer boss to act as a, as a lookout. Um, anchoring, very often dozers are going to be anchoring because they're coming from a road, they park and work from there if they're going directly into the fire. And if it's, if it's high hazard, then you, you do need to make sure that you anchor. Um, communications, again, it can be loud on the machine. You're on either inside now. Make sure that, and if you, you want to have a communication with all the dozers, but if not, then certainly the lead dozer would, if you can only, you know, be in touch with, say you got two and you can only be in touch with one, make sure it's the lead dozer. And again, that communication is both ways. Escape routes, often your dozer guard will be your escape route. And safety zones, it could be the black, but one advantage is that dozers can make their own safe safety zone. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about entrapment. So fitness can be an issue because, um, <coughs> excuse me, no stereotypes, but you see some, you see some big people, you see some big lads uh, working heavy equipment and they've got to be able to get out of there if there's a fire. So for forestry, for example, we have a fitness test. It's the same one that I have to do. It's not that strenuous, but you have to be able to carry a 20 pound with 20 pounds on your back, you have to walk, I think it's two miles in 30 minutes. So we do have a fitness test that we have for uh, forestry heads, for, including for operators, as well as education, uh, wildfire orientation, so that they know what's going on, but also uh, some level of fitness if they have to get out. 
and also working in the heat. Fatigue, I talked about fatigue. So to me, that is a big safety issue because dozers are often working through the night, putting in long days, so are dozer bosses. And then when you get, there's obviously there's a point where you get too tired that you're not safe, you're not thinking straight, and uh, and that's not prime. So we want to be aware of that and make uh, arrangements for that. So dangerous goods and, and hydrogen uh, H2S. So we want to be aware, especially in the settled areas, we may have dangerous goods. It could be uh, pipelines. It could be, again, we're dealing with agriculture. Uh, it, it may be trans, transport too when we're in, we're in an interface situation, uh, but very often it's going to be pipelines. And if we're working around oil and gas infrastructure, knowing about H2S, not going to give you an H2S lesson here. It's, it's, it's good. And again, most people working heavy equipment in Lackawish area will have their H2S as training. One thing I do want to talk about some of the rules we have about working around dozers. And some of them are very similar to what we have for working around aircraft. So dozers, they're altering the environment. They're pushing those trees down. So we want to stay at least two tree lengths from them. The theory basically being that when a tree comes down, it could hit another one, a domino, and bring that one down. So you want to be at least two tree lengths from where they're working. Uh, generally, we just don't want to be working around the dozers. Uh, if they're working at night, they're not going to be near our crews. If they're if we're working on the fire and the dozers are coming through, what I really recommend is that the crews stop working, leave the line, get out of the way, take it, take a break, refresh, regroup, let the dozers pass, and then go back in. If you are working on dozer line two, it's a good idea to keep your hose to one side. Uh, and often that would be the fire side because if the dozers come back. To, to refresh the line or work the line or widen the line. I, I've watched dozers go over hose and, and it's, a, it's, it's, you get to see a nice fountain, right? It's nice, it's a nice, yeah, you see some, they don't stand up very well to, um, to the tracks. So you keep the hose off to the side, really try and avoid working around them. If the dozers are boss themselves, or anyone if you're working around dozers, if you're, again, it's very similar to aircraft, if you're going to talk to the dozer operator, if you're going to approach them, make sure that you have radio contact or at least eye contact with them so that you've, they've, they've acknowledged you. We've had quads run over by dozers. It's not, and people laugh, they say it's like that Austin Powers thing where the steamroller ran over, is whatever. But it happens because they're, they're, they're loud. So they're loud, the machinery, the visibility is often, like often, yeah, they've, they've got those cabs, the glass is often it's dirty, it's dusty, it's smoky. Uh, the visibility is often not the best. So you need to be careful working around them. You need to make sure they're aware of you if you're in their zone. And so again, you make that eye contact or radio contact and they must lower their blade and stop. Um, those tracks, if those tracks move, that you can get pinched between there. That's not good, right? You don't want to be standing on those. So usually it's a matter of you've made eye contact or you've made verbal contact, the blade is down and usually the door is open. They, op they open their door up and they're signaling to you. So be very careful approaching approaching the dozers, working around them. For the dozer boss in particular, if you're gonna be working around them, your visibility is important, they can see you. So we most always, dozer bosses are most always wearing a head headlamp at night. Sometimes they'll have glow sticks hanging from their vest, like from the back, so they can be seen from the back or whatever. But uh, make sure that you're visible and obviously high visibility clothing. Often we've got a high vis vest in addition to our fire gear uh, for the dozer boss. Now, there's a great temptation, especially on larger fires, for people to, to grab a ride on the Nodwell, grab a ride on the dozer, but that's a no-no. So you only ride in the machinery that's designated for design, sorry, for passenger use. Some nod wells do have units, they use them more for tree planting, right? But they do have units where people can sit when we want those. What we've got in this photograph, we didn't cover this in other equipment. This is a Hagland. So it's Hagland, it's a, a German army piece of machinery. And um, they, forestry is trying to use them more because helicopters are so expensive and they can also get fogged in or they get taken off for bucketing. We try to use these more for moving crews uh, in our remote areas. And Hagland is good because, and you can see in this picture, it will float. It's uh, and also it, it's got low ground pressure. Although I say that, I pulled up this slide, this picture first under the category of safety, 
And look at Buddy here with his nose stuck out the window, just about to hit the bank there. I don't know how safe that is or how safe it is being in open water. We don't, I mean, this, I think they're just showing off what a Hagley can do here. We don't want them and you wouldn't be in open water recommended. Point being, only ride in equipment that's designated for passengers. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about entrapment specifically. So if you remember from our previous wildfire lesson, what we talked about, the biggest way we deal with entrapment is to avoid it. The biggest way we avoid it is by, by using laces, our lookouts, anchor points, communications, escape routes, and safety zones, particularly the communications and the safety zones. So if you're looking at an entrapment situation with dozers, look at building your own safety zone if there's time. So we think, well, it's great. You got a dozer, you can make your own safety zone, but you can see, and unfortunately in this photograph, this fellow did die in this, this dozer operator did die. He didn't have time, right? So uh, you need time for that, to build that safety zone. And as we talk about the safety zones, how big does it need to be? We often talk about flame length. So if you're dealing with grass fuels, it doesn't have to be that big. If you're dealing with black spruce, yeah, it's gotta be pretty big or, or tall white spruce. So build that safety zone if you have time, they can do that. And then you think, well, geez, if you've got time to build it, you've got time to get out of there. And that might not necessarily be the case. I remember one fire, it was called the Brown Fire at the end of the Cowpar Road one year. And it was I was just getting my recce flight before I took over as ops chief, but it was tense because we were watching the fire, we were watching the dozers, and then we could see the safety zone. And the dozers were heading for the safety zone, and we're trying to gauge, are they, are they gonna get to there before the fire gets to them? Who's moving faster, the dozers or, the, or the, the, um, the, the dozers or the fire? And you might say, well, just go into the black. Well, if you're dealing with muskeg, maybe it's not suitable ground for you to go to. Maybe you're restricted to know what grounds you can be on. So uh, one option is to build your own safety zone if you have time. If within the, your safety zone, you with a dozer, you can actually build a pit, like dig a pit to get into. And so you're, you're gonna be lower, you can build a bit of a berm on, it's gonna protect you somewhat from the radiant heat. Uh, so you can do that. Um, one thing I've, ne I don't think I've seen them here in Alberta. And again, uh, anyone here is experienced with those might correct me on this, but look at on this top left, these are fire curtains. So a lot of dozers in the States and, and, and a lot of even fire apparatus, like fire trucks in the States and in Australia have these fire curtains because what's the weak point uh, that's likely to give and that's, and that's your glass. So, um, so if you have fire curtains, deploy them, pull them down. They're gonna give you protection. One thing to say about dozers is maybe tempting to get underneath it because you got all this metal between you and the fire. It's gonna protect you from the radiant heat, but be careful of that because it could settle, especially if you're in soft ground and end up being crushed. One thing we say for any entrapment situation, and it certainly applies to dozers as well as it would to crews, is to ask for air support, ask for drops. And again, that importance of them knowing where you are. So ask for air support and let your let your supervisor know that you're facing that entrapment situation. Uh, so certainly, yeah, I, I could have pulled up pictures. But I did have one of burnt dozers. They get they get burnt. They get burnt over, and uh, um, it, it does happen. And we do unfortunately get fatalities with that too. So it's it's very important that we follow our laces and all of our other safety considerations. So that is it. Uh, finish the. That's, that's that's it for the presentation for tonight. I know that Newhook is gone. So it's just, um, again, I'm pretty much done. So uh, if there's any questions. Yeah, I'm actually yeah, back. I'm actually back. Oh, if back. anybody has Sorry. any questions, just feel free to speak up. Uh, speak up, guys. So Dave, if I'm understanding, your dozer boss is walking. Uh, if it's in heavy bush at night, uh, how are you guiding yourself? Are you following the cat or? I'm just trying to picture how you're you're navigating this in the, in at nighttime. Right, so at nighttime, um, or at any time really, it's a matter of your back and forth. Like you're walking in front of the dozers for part of it to see what's up ahead. Again, if you've gotten a flight, maybe you know when it's not that bad. So you walk ahead of them for a bit, 
And you come back and you go into the fire or out into the green, stay, stay safe, or you have them stop and you talk to them as you go by, and then you check the work they've done. So basically it's going up and down the line like that, generally. I mean, it might be just be sitting in your truck, letting them do their thing. Uh, sometimes that's, that's what you're doing. A lot of dozer bosses, like standard, they come with a quad because they like their quads for going out. I'm not much of a piston head and I find they get stuck and, and you people that know me know that I like to walk too. So I don't usually take a quad. It's very common for dozer bosses to use a quad. So again, they're kind of going up and down the line, checking what they've got to do, looking for hazards or laying out you know, pipelines or, or, or the fire location of the fire. And they're going back and they're checking the, the work that's been done. Does that make sense, Ed? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Okay, Curtis. Yeah, Dave, I had a question for you about that. Uh, the picture with the uh, the fire curtains, the cat with the fire curtains on it. Yeah. In the center of the ceiling of that cab, what is that mounted to the uh, just on the ceiling? I don't have the picture, but I wouldn't know, Curtis. <laughs> yeah, oh, maybe okay. It's, maybe it's part of their AC unit. I don't know, the lights or fans, I don't know. But uh, that photo was just to show the, the curtains there. Oh, okay, I just, yeah, I thought, thought that might have been something like some sort of, I don't know, maybe wild fire suppression or something. I I don't know, I've never seen one of those in a cat before, so thought yeah. maybe, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, as before, if there's if there's no other questions or comments, we can we can call that a night. And as I said for the previous one, if anyone comes up with questions or has questions afterwards, by all means, get in touch with me. And uh, whatever I don't know, I can try and find someone to answer for you. All right. And actually, just just before we sign off, um, just thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, we got quite a few people again tonight, so it's, this has gone well. Uh, thanks, Dave, for pre presenting again. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording, so once we get this um, saved, uh, we'll get it up to our YouTube channel and share that link out with everybody. Um, Chief's email went out today. Uh, looks like the earliest uh, in-class training is going to return is June 16th. Um, just waiting for another update from uh, from Kenny. Uh, so there are other online options if anybody's looking in the Moodle classroom there. Um, and we'll look at uh, possibly putting on some other topics through this same form through Teams because this seems to be uh, fairly successful right now. Um, so yeah, if anybody, uh, actually, you know what, but maybe before we sign off, I see Mo's hand up there. I'll let him uh, ask his question. Hey, Dave. Yeah, I just was curious with the way technology is going these days and the way drones have advanced. Is that something possible to add to the team along with the cats and the water unit and the dozer boss to have their own little kind of air support? Has Forestry thought about doing stuff like that? Yeah, you bet, Mo. Um, for sure it is. I mean, drones, I mean, we talk about the eye in the sky for safety and drones are more... I, I, I want to say more accessible and easier option than helicopters. Helicopters, I mean, I'm, I'm old school, of course, and helicopters, a drone can't drop buckets of water right yet, and they can't deliver people. But uh, certainly for that, they have potential for that mo, and people are looking at it. It's just not common practice now. Right on, thanks. All right, so uh, if that's it, thanks everybody. And as Dave mentioned, he's available. I'll, I'll put his email address out uh, when we send the link out. But thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Good night.